Seminary. Um, I, before I go further, I would especially like to thank the staff and the students at Morrow Seminary for hosting us tonight. Thank you very much for having us here for this evening. We have a few other guests with us, some members of the Corby community, and perhaps some local clergy are with us as well. Uh, very nice for us to be together. It's my uh, privilege to introduce to you our speaker this evening, Father Edward J. Griswold. Father Ed is the 2017 Martin Visiting Fellow in Preaching, and known to many here as the teacher of Preaching too. at the moment. Uh, Father Ed is a priest of the Diocese of Trenton, New Jersey, and he is also Associate Professor of Pastoral Theology, the Henry J. and Marion I. Knott Professor of Homiletics, and Vice Rector at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, Maryland. He's with us for this fall semester doing some writing and research, and he's going to speak this evening on preconciliar preaching in the USA. Please welcome Father Ed Griswold. Thank you, and thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, I have a lot of thank yous to uh, express. This might be the only moment I get a chance to do some of it, so I'm just going to do a little bit of it right now. First, I'm grateful to the Martin family for providing this fellowship for this opportunity to be here at Notre Dame. I'm particularly grateful to Father Mike Connors and to, where is she, Carla, there she, where is she, Carla, uh, Carla, as well, my colleagues who have welcomed me uh, so wonderfully here to Notre Dame. Uh, I see Father Austin here. I have a wonderful home at Corby Hall, and I thank the community of the Holy Cross. They've been great and really enjoyable to live with. And to the students I meet in class, thank you. I've enjoyed it. I hope you're finding it worthwhile. Uh, it gives me life. I hope it gives you life as well. You know, as I stand here before you, I, I think of a childhood experience that I had. I had an Uncle Alex. And Uncle Alex was a film producer. The problem, though, is that the films that Uncle Alex produced were home movies. Whenever we visited Uncle Alex's home, before we went in, my mother would say to us, sit quietly and be polite, as we watched home movies that had nothing to do with our lives, but were of his friends, of his hunting, of his fishing. Uh, I think if my mother was looking at what I'm doing here tonight, she might say to all of you, please do my son a favor, sit quietly and just be polite as we go through this together. Uh, my concern is that I am really into this. I am loving the research I'm doing, and I'm not so sure you are, but I hope you will get into it a little bit. Uh, we have a Latin professor back at St. Mary's who gets frustrated because it's an elective course for most students, and some just sign up because they're sort of interested. They want to read the inscriptions around the building, or he doesn't know really why they sign up. But one time he was on the elevator with one of them who said to him, Oh, Father, I have to drop that course. I, I didn't expect it to be as difficult as it is. Can't you just give us the gist of Latin? Which is what he says to us every once in a while. The gist of Latin. There is no such thing. But perhaps you might get a little gist of preconciliar preaching here tonight. Um, let me just say that this is part of a larger project that I am about. And the larger project is really trying to put an anthology together of preaching American Catholic preaching in English before the council and after the council, 50 years before, 50 years after. There really is very little out there for us in the classroom when we want to refer to such things. There are some anthologies of American preaching, but if there's one or two Catholics that get in Catholics about it, and most of them are post-conciliar. So to have something to fill in that blank of, well, what was going on? Because some people are too quick, I think, to criticize what was going on and really have no idea that it was a mixed bag as it is today. 
There are some very good things were going on then, and there were some difficult things that were happening for the people of God. But I hope that my work will help us have this kind of a handbook, an anthology, that people can refer to and get a real taste of what the preaching was like. Because it's an anthology, I'm really not going tonight to give you broad strokes about preaching or summarize or analyze the preaching. I am going to share with you what an anthology does in preaching. Basically, it gives you a little biological, pardon, biographical background, not biological, biographical <laughs> background, a little context, and then pieces of the sermons. Now, I am very uncomfortable about doing that because taking a piece of a sermon is like giving you a line from a poem. <laughs> It doesn't help you appreciate the whole thing. But that's about the best I can do tonight. As you know, some of these sermons years ago were 20 minutes, 30 minutes long, so I wouldn't have time to share with you a whole sermon. But I will pick up some of the things that I think are substantial and that are very typical of the times or of the preacher. So that's basically how it's going to go. If you're looking for that overview of preaching before and after the council, I would recommend Father Garrick de Bona's article in the Handbook of Preaching. Uh, matter of fact, Father Connors has an article in there as well. That's a very, there are two chapters in there, one on pre-conciliar preaching, one on post-conciliar preaching. That will give you a, an analysis of what was going on and an overview of those things. As I have decided which preaching and which preachers I would include in, include in the anthology, I have a bit of a hierarchy of concerns here. My biggest interest is to gather Eucharistic preaching. Next, other liturgical kinds of preaching, retreat or mission preaching, and then even public lectures and written material. So my definition of preaching is rather large, and the reason for that is I want it to include other voices besides voices that would have the right to stand in a pulpit and preach, because some of them were very significant proclaimers of the gospel at that time. So that allows me to be more inclusive than I would be if I were just doing liturgical or Eucharistic preaching. I'm going to do the best I can to put this in chronological order, but it's, it's a little mixed about how old some people are and when they preached and when we were going to find a sermon that was significant. Okay. And finally, this is a work in progress. I expect that there will be things that I'm saying here tonight that in the end I may take out. And there may be, and I know there will be plenty more things that I'll be adding. I'm not a church historian. I'm merely a homiletician looking for treasures. So if you have some suggestions, some corrections, some ideas, please let me know because we're in the process of putting this all together. All right, so let's get started here. And we're going to look at our first preacher tonight is James Cardinal Gibbons. Gibbons is a well-known Archbishop of Baltimore, himself a Baltimorean, but as those of us who live in Baltimore and weren't born there say, a Baltimorean. He was born in Baltimore in 1834 and died there in 1921. He had been the Apostolic Vicar of North Carolina, the Bishop of Richmond, Virginia, and then the ninth Archbishop of Baltimore. He was the second Cardinal in the United States and he attended the First Vatican Council. By the way, he voted in favor of papal infallibility if you wanted to know. <laughs> During his 44 years as Archbishop of Baltimore, he became well known in this country as a defender of the rights of labor. And it's even said that he was one of the people that helped convince Pope Leo XIII to indicate that Catholics were free to join labor unions and that labor unions were good for the working force. Now, this may be where I show my prejudices here when I mention to you that Cardinal Gibbons entered St. Charles Seminary in Baltimore in 1855, and he entered the major seminary, St. Mary's, in 1857. Both of them are my alma mater, my almes matres, maybe, and also they're the ones that pay my salary every day, even today. So we're going to start with Cardinal Gibbons. <laughs> At the age of 34, he was consecrated a bishop, one of the youngest Catholic bishops in the country. Some referred to him as a boy bishop at the time. 
While he was vicar of North Carolina, he befriended many Protestant people because there were very few Catholics in the state. While he was there, he wrote an, an apologetic work entitled Faith of Our Fathers, and it was the handbook of the time for apologetics. Over time, Gibbons became a very popular religious leader and preacher. He gathered large crowds to hear his sermons that were often aimed at an audience of Christians of all denominations. He became acquainted with every president from Andrew Johnson to Warren B. Harding and became an advisor to several. He advocated the creation of the Catholic University of America and became its first chancellor. Gibbons died at the age of 86 as a widely popular religious leader. He was the face of American Catholicism at the time. He had a reputation, of course, as a friend of labor, as I said, yet he discouraged class consciousness and he condemned industrial violence. Reports say that President Theodore Roosevelt referred to him as the most venerated, respected, and useful citizen in America. The sample of Gibbons' preaching that I have chosen for tonight was delivered at Baltimore's first cathedral, now called the National Shrine of the Basilica of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's a sermon right there, long enough anyway. <laughs> It was preached on the third Sunday of, of Epiphany, as it was known in those days. Context. What I find interesting in this very patriotic sermon is that it was delivered in what historians call the era of immigration. Remember, from that time, about previously 50 years or more, there had been an enormous immigration of Catholics from Europe. Note in this sermon how Gibbons is speaking so positively and encouragingly about the integration of Catholic immigrants into the American culture. His extravagant praise of Bishop John Carroll as a true patriot seems to be saying, we belong here as Catholics. We don't have to become Protestant to be truly American. At the time, there was a real fear that Catholics were being lured away from the Catholic Church by other denominations with the implication that to be Protestant was to be truly American. Notice too Gibbon's persuasive call for evangelization of those other Americans who do not know the true faith. This is not a sermon you could borrow for an ecumenical gathering, okay? <laughs> it's not like that. So the sermon, it's really based on the text from Matthew 8, 1 to 13, particularly on this line. I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Gibbons preaches. It seems to me that this prophecy of our Savior finds an appropriate application in the progress of the religion of Christ in the United States. For have we not beheld hosts of our fellow Christians coming to our shores from the east and west of Europe and reclining with their native brethren, the spiritual children of Abraham, in the courts of the Lord? Before proceeding to dwell upon the leading causes contributing to the growth of the Catholic religion in the United States, it is not out of place to make some allusion to the first Archbishop of Baltimore, whose patriotism and sagacity inaugurated an era of goodwill between the church and the new republic. I regard the selection of Dr. Carroll as a most providential event for the welfare of the American church. If a prelate of narrow views, a man out of sympathy or harmony with the genius of the new republic had been chosen, the progress of religion would have been seriously impeded. It is true, the Constitution has declared that no one should be molested on account of religion, but a written instrument would have been a feeble barrier to stem the tide of popular and traditional prejudice unless it was vindicated and fortified by the patriotic, uh, patriotic example of the patriarch of the American church. John Carroll was the man for the occasion. 
we may apply to him the word spoken of John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness, to be a witness of the light. He was a man of sterling piety and enlightened zeal. These gifts endeared him to the faithful. He was a man of consummate tact, of courteous manners, and unfailing charity. He enjoyed intimate relations with his fellow townsmen in the various walks of life without distinction of creed. He was deeply concerned in civil as well as in religious affairs. The interest that he took in social and literary improvement rendered him very popular with his fellow citizens. He was with all a sturdy patriot and he labored indefatigably for the success of American independence. In 1776, he accompanied Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Chase, and Charles Carroll of Carrollton in their mission to Canada to secure the cooperation of that country in the cause of colonial autonomy. He was thoroughly in touch with the spirit of our institutions, and by these loyal sentiments, he won the esteem and confidence of his countrymen and the friendship of the first chief magistrate, the immortal George Washington. Then he goes on a little later. At the present time, one century since Baltimore was raised to a metropolitan see, the church in the United States comprises a hierarchy of nearly 100 bishops, 16,000 priests, and a Catholic population numbering 14 million. If we include our Puerto Rico and Philippine possessions, the number of the faithful under the aegis of the American flag will amount to fully 22 million. Let us now consider to what auspicious agencies we are to ascribe this marvelous growth, the development of Christ's kingdom in the great republic of the West, he says, is due under God to three causes the natural increase of families, conversions, and the stream of immigration pouring from foreign lands during the past century. Then he goes on to enumerate those different causes and their meaning. And he finishes up with these two paragraphs. May we all, both clergy and people, remember that there are 75 million of our fellow countrymen who are yet outside the true fold. May we do all in our power that they may enjoy with us the plenitude of our Christian heritage, that they may recline with us at the heavenly banquet which our Lord has prepared for the spiritual children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and may acknowledge with us the supremacy of Christ's vicar upon earth. God grant that the religion of Christ which in the first ages of Christianity impelled the learned and luxurious Romans to submit to the sweet yoke of the gospel, and which centuries later gained peaceful victories over the warlike Goths and Vandals, Huns and Visigoths, Saxons, Saracens and Lombards, and other conquering invaders of Europe, and molded them all into one Christian family. They may all unite the heterogeneous multitudes that flock to our shores from other nations, as well as the sturdy des descendants of the primitive settlers in the one fold of the one shepherd, so that all who pay allegiance to a common flag and uphold a common constitution may combine in reverencing the same banner of the cross, in worshiping at the same altar, and in professing one Lord, one faith, one baptism, what God and Father of all. Clearly, we would not preach this way today. <laughs> I hope we wouldn't. But I think you can see that some of what was going on there were things that we could learn a great deal from. Some, I think, powerful imagery. Some of the strength and authority that he speaks with. I think there's some great riches in, in this preaching before the council. And I hope that you're picking up some of it here. This kind of patriotic speech we would not find so clearly in our pulpits today, probably for good reason. 
but we should respect where the church was at in those days and where this was coming from, from a leader of the church. How about now we move on to our second preacher, Walter Elliot. Elliot was a Paulist priest. He was born in 1842 in Detroit, I think like the rectors from Detroit. But even more significantly, he came to Notre Dame when he was 12 years old and studied here. Peter? come and preach at the solemn mass and in the sermon he praised Father Soren as a true Americanist <laughs> okay. a great patriot uh -huh. and I just thought it was interesting that uh, he was your first choice so oh. I, I, just a little note of yeah. a little history and uh, he was the ranking churchman who came for the uh, consecration okay. of the yeah, thanks, thanks so much that Americanist uh, <laughs> a, a adjective is quite interesting uh, <laughs> And I, we, we talked a little bit about here in just a moment, but a distinction from Americanism huh? and that phenomenon. This was a whole other category, Americanist. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment because Father Elliot was pretty involved in that. Huh? But anyway, he came here to Notre Dame at 12 years old. I don't know if there was some prep school here at the time or what that was all about, but I assume that's what happened. But when he left here, he returned to Detroit to go into business with his brother. One biographer writes, he was a strapping youth of great stature and breadth of frame. He stood six feet, three inches tall. Before entering the polis, Elliot had a very adventuresome life, serving in the Union Army, fighting bravely throughout the Civil War. He was not a professional soldier, but a very patriotic American. He had a strong sense of American identity and was a leader among those who favored what some call a new American Catholicism, which we should see as distinct from the Americanism phenomenon, okay? So different from Americanism. We'll talk about Americanism in a little bit, though. When the call for volunteers for the Civil War was issued, Elliot and two of his brothers enlisted in the 5th Ohio, the Fighting 5th, they called it. Elliot was captured on two different occasions by the enemy, and each time was returned to his regiment. His brother William fought and died at Gettysburg. Another brother, Robert, was mortally wounded while in command of the 16th Michigan Infantry at Tololopotomy Creek in Virginia. Well, because his mother was so upset with losing two sons, they released Walter from the service. But this was already six months past his original enlistment, so it wasn't like he got out of anything. He was there six months longer than he was supposed to be. He was in 12 battles during the war, one being the Battle of Gettysburg. And I can't help but wonder if he and his brother hadn't received absolution from Father Corby there on the fields of Gettysburg. Huh? During his service, Elliot was offered a commission to be a, a, an officer, but he refused it. He said he preferred to be with the common soldier than to enjoy the glory of an officer's position. Upon his return from the war, he took up the practice of law in Cincinnati. And during that time as a lawyer, he attended a banquet in Detroit. And it was there that he first met Father Hecker, who was the founder of the Paulists. And he first heard him speak. Very, very soon after that, he decided to enter the Paulists. Some claim that he was the first Roman Catholic born in the faith to join the community. All Paulists at the time were converts, including the founder, Father Hecker. In time, Eliot became a close friend a disciple and a confidant, a confidant of Father Hecker. He traveled for 20 years on mission to non-Catholics, spreading the gospel in the spirit of Father Hecker with that same zeal and enthusiasm. Eventually, he withdrew from that ministry so that he could be at the side of Father Hecker in his last days. Father Hecker's, after Father Hecker's death, Elliot returned to the missions and the ministry of converting non-Catholics. It was during these years that he wrote that life of Father Hecker that's so significant in the Americanism controversy. He always maintained that Father Hecker was a saint. It was the French mistranslation of that work that was the impetus for Pope Leo XIII's letter to Cardinal Gibbons condemning Americanism. Gibbons really defended 
Hecker in that controversy and said that this was a misunderstanding of what he believed. Father Elliot died in 1928. In a volume entitled Parish Sermons, Elliot compiled a complete set of his sermons for the liturgical year. The sermon that I will now share with you was prepared for Sexagesima Sunday as a special commemoration of St. Paul. One aspect of its significance to my mind is that we've got this famous Paulist preaching about Paul. What would they be saying about Paul in those days? Also, what stood out to me was Eliot's strong orientation towards evangelization of non-Catholics in the spirit of St. Paul and his mentor, Hecker. Note to his unabashed patriotism as the immigrant population struggled through the long journey to enculturation. I also was struck by Eliot's imaging of the experience of conversion in Paul and also on his understanding of the life of faith. Here's what he has to say on Sexagesima Sunday. This Sunday is chosen by the church, my brethren, for special commemoration of St. Paul. And in happier times, the Supreme Pontiff on this day celebrated Holy Mass with marvelous splendor at the Basilica of St. Paul. I think at this time, the Basilica had had a fire and wasn't in use. So I think that's why what he's talking about here at happier times. His, meaning Paul's conversion, taken from the Acts of the Apostles, is read as the epistle of the Mass, and in the collect, his intercession is invoked. These are reasons enough for taking him for our theme. But another reason, and a weighty one, is the vocation of Catholic Americans to convert this country. Bear that in mind while listening to our discourse on the conversion of the apostle of the nations. In St. Paul, my brethren, we behold the grace of God energizing an earnest nature. It is the positive and radical character consecrated to the spread of Christ's truth and righteousness. We behold intense conviction and enthusiasm carrying the gospel of Christ to the ends of the earth a character conspicuous for fidelity to conscience, pleads with manful candor for faith in Christ to the Athenians and in Caesar's palace to the masters of the world. Holy Church proclaims him the preacher of the truth to the whole earth. How truly has the man blended with the apostle? How plainly does Paul the apostle retain all that is good of the independence of Saul of Tarsus, ever outspoken, ever intrepid. Once it was for error and hate, now it is for truth and love as it is in Christ Jesus. Had he not been the Hebrew Saul, he could not have been the Christian Paul. But how is a fierce personality changed from wrong to right? Only by trials of humility and obedience divinely administered, and that with an energy proportioned to the person's independence of character. My brethren, this is one of the lessons of St. Paul's conversion. Read again the epistle of this Sunday and contrast the fiery zealot breathing out threatenings and slaughter and the utterly subjugated creature quivering upon the ground and murmuring, Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? Great is the renown of holy obedience, since the foremost preacher of liberty of spirit obeys most submissively at the first instant of his conversion. And he obeys not only the voice of Jesus, but the voice and hand of a fellow man, even a stranger, only then does he receive again his bodily sight, and only then is his soul filled with the Holy Ghost. Then he goes on to say, what is the first question of newborn faith? Is it, Lord, what more wilt thou have me believe? Not so the faith of St. Paul, but rather, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? With some natures, to believe is to do. Zeal is the first effect of faith that is apostolic. 
and all the more if one's nature can be an earnest one. Was it not a man of mighty faith and mighty nature who would set out to preach Christ to the whole world on the strength of a private revelation? Yea, for the man who as a Jew had been a zealot for the law, now to turn and proclaim that no man is saved by the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. It was a marvelous change indeed. And he confesses to Christ, when the blood of Stephen, Stephen thy witness was shed, I stood by and consented. Even now, as he draws near to his fate, he breathes out fiery threats of vengeance and death against Christ's followers. And then, O oh, mighty love of Jesus, as if a river were suddenly halted in its course and its waters thrown back and piled up, and then like a torrent in the south, a deluge of Christian zeal blending with it all, all other holy endowments, natural and supernatural. It sweeps Jerusalem from its high place, sweeps pagan idolatry away, and places Christ crucified in supreme control of mankind. Fiery stuff here, fiery stuff. This greatest conversion of Christian history teaches us never to despair of the conversion of anyone however furiously prejudiced. And St. Paul's subsequent apostolate heartens us to undertake the conversion of natures, excuse me, to undertake the conversion of nations, the most idolatrous or the most utterly worldly minded, even our own nation. And he concludes, O glorious and magnificent apostle, True Israelite, the heroic faith of Abraham is in thy blood. The awful majesty of Moses is on thy brow. The fire of Elias burns in thy every word. But in all this and above it all, thou bearest the wounds of Jesus in thy body, and the seal of his love is upon thy soul. His divine word thou wieldest as the Holy Spirit's two-edged sword of truth and of love. Pray for us. Pray for us, O apostle of the nations, with special fervor, for thy master has set us apart for the conversion of the greatest nation of the whole world. The church was struggling to be a part of this nation and expressing its love, its patriotism, its fidelity to the ideals that this nation was about. All of it, you can see a reflection of the times, is, is expressed in this preaching. Now here's a character that you will probably recognize his name, I hope. Father Coughlin. Charles Coughlin was born in Hamilton, Ontario in 1891. He entered the seminary and was ordained for the Bazillion Fathers in Toronto. However, in 1923, the Holy, Order, the Holy See ordered a change in the structure of that congregation from a society of common life, like the Society of Saint-Sulpice, to that of a religious order, like the Congregation of the Holy Cross, with the requirement of the traditional three religious vows. Coughlin could not accept this change, so he moved to the United States to be incarnated in the Archdiocese of Detroit in 1923. After serving a few parishes, Coughlin was then assigned to the newly founded and famous Shrine of the Little Flower. At the time, the parish had only 25 families in the largely Protestant suburb of Royal Oak, Michigan. Very soon, however, as a result of his powerful preaching, the parish numbers grew rapidly. By 1926, Coughlin was broadcasting an hour-long radio show that began in response to a cross-burning by the Ku Klux Klan on the grounds of his parish church. Four years later, the show began to be broadcast nationally by CBS. Up until the Depression, the content of his sermons were primarily spiritual and about pious practices. In January 1930, he began to communicate more political messages. He initiated his attacks on socialism 
and Soviet communism. He was also critical of American capitalists whose greed, he said, made communism more attractive to other people. Because of his widespread reputation as an anti-communist, he, he appeared before the House Committee to investigate communist activities in 1930. Initially, he was a strong supporter of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his New Deal. Coughlin became is famous for the phrase, the New Deal is Christ deal. <laughs> but by late in 1934, Christ must have changed his opinion because Coughlin changed his about Roosevelt and about the New Deal. He began to label the president's monetary policies as unconstitutional and pseudo-capitalistic. Over time, he became even more outspoken in his criticism of the Roosevelt administration. In addition, any number of other problems began to develop for him, one of them and the primary one being the accusation of anti-Semitism, which he strongly denied on various occasions. By 1934, Coughlin was said to be the most prominent Roman Catholic spokesman on political and financial matters. His radio program, The Golden Hour of the Little Flower, was reaching 10 million people every week. But on May 1st, 1942, Bishop Mooney of Detroit ordered him to stop his political activities. Coughlin complied and returned full-time to his duties as pastor of the Shrine of the Little Flower. He remained pastor there until 1966 when he retired. Coughlin died in 1979 at the age of 88. This sermon has an interesting title, and I hope you find it as interesting as I do. It's entitled, Ballots, Not Bullets. Ballots, Not Bullets. It was preached on the radio from the pulpit of the Shrine of the Little Flower on Passion Sunday in the year either 31 or 32. It's not clear. You'll notice strong anti-communist and anti-Henry Ford sentiments. <laughs> Nothing was uh, eliminated from the pulpit in those days, it seems. These are nestled in the midst of some very strong pro-labor principles. He starts, yesterday afternoon, a vast throng of Detroiters gathered to attend the simple funeral of four slain men. It was simple in one sense. In another, it was unique to see a procession of 10,000 marching men, not one of them carrying an American flag. There were plenty of red flags. As you know, last week, there was a demonstration in which some of Detroit's jobless, suffering laborers participated. We since learned that this demonstration had been organized by the communists. However, thousands of those who marched through the streets of the city of Detroit were orderly and were obedient. In every respect, they were obedient to the policemen who accompanied them. By no means were they all communists. The object of the demonstrators was to march to the Ford Automobile Factory factories, which are located not in Detroit, but in the city of Dearborn, adjacent to Detroit. It appears that the jobless marchers had determined to send a delegation from their ranks to the Ford executives to ask for part-time jobs. But when they approached the Ford factory, radical leaders urged them to trespass upon private property. Promptly, they were halted, greeted with tear gas bombs, covered with ice-cold water, which was shot at them out of a fire hose and eventually bombarded with bullets as they persisted in their trespassing. The four victims of this unfortunate occurrence were buried yesterday afternoon. Some newspapers referred to this tragedy as a communist uprising. Undoubtedly, there were communists who were the chief agitators and organizers. But the fact of the matter still remains that it is difficult for any sane man to comprehend why the communists should take action against the Ford Motor Company in view of the fact that Ford men, Ford money, and Ford machinery probably have done more to perfect the Soviet five-year plan than was contributed by any other single agency in America. 
it is generally understood that Soviet Russia and Henry Ford are on the best of terms. He goes on with this tirade for quite a while. <laughs> and then he gets to something of a conclusion here. He says, after 150 years, how proud we would be if today we could report to our forefathers that the republic is more secure and constant and powerful and great than at any other time in its history. In potentialities, our country is more truly great. But in actualities, it has sunk to its lowest depths from which we shall rise and please God, which we shall never see again. Our republic is more secure with its navy weakened, its army demoralized, and its officers of the law calling upon the gangsters of the land to come to their assistance? Our republic more constant? And yet we have lived to see the day when the advice of George Washington and his foreign entanglements has been torn like a scrap of paper? Our country more truly great? Yes, if greatness is identified as a fact that our banks are choking with gold and hoarding it in their vaults, if our public utilities have made more money during the years of the Depression than at any other time in their history, if our churches have been emptied, if our streets have been filled with eight million unemployed, if the ferocity of the Indian savage has been outdone by the ferocity of the rum runner and kidnapper, if taxation has been multiplied to an unbearable degree, if these and a thousand other more elements that have crept into our national life are treated as mere fancies and fairy dreams, then we are truly great. My friends, there is something deeper, more substantial, which has been removed from the foundation of our national life than the mere loss of money and loss of jobs. Although some will blase, blame mass productionism, although others will cry out against internationalism, although a few will trace all our evils to the mockery of prohibition, yet underneath all of these there is the lack of Christian charity. That is the main foundation which has been destroyed. Meanwhile, these are days of suffering. These are the days of Calvary, which precede the joys of Easter morn. Thus, on this Passion Sunday and next Sunday, when there will be enacted for us the trial and death of Jesus Christ, I implore you, my friends, not to measure life by the cradle and the grave, not to count as great the mere possession of gold, which you cannot take with you into the world beyond, but count that man as great, who despite the vicissitudes of life, can raise aloft the standard of Christ's flag, can sing in his heart the principles of Christ's charity, and if necessary, can trudge beside the master along the highway of this Jerusalem, up the steeps of Calvary, and bow his head in resignation, while his hands and heart and feet are pierced with the nails of greed and the spear point of oppression. Not surprising he has the reputation that he has, huh? Uh, but masterful with words, tremendous imagery, powerful conviction. What I'd like to do now is for us to take a look at one of the preachers that um, I deliberately did not want to leave out of this consideration because I really believe she is someone who proclaimed the gospel even though she was never in a pulpit. Servant of God Dorothy Day 
is so well known to the, in Catholic circles today, she needs very little by way of introduction. Dorothy is one of those who proclaimed the gospel in the United States before Vatican II, but did not have access to the pulpit. And from what I read, I'm not sure she even wanted it. She wasn't dying to be a priest or something. Huh? Her pulpit, in many ways, was her writings and her publications. She was born in New York in 1897 and died in 1980 at the age of 83. Hers is one of the most important Catholic voices that bridges both Vatican before the Council and after the Council, those 50 years. She was a journalist, a social activist, and a convert, as we all know. She was one of the founders of the Catholic Worker Movement and, is well known, and her well-known newspaper, The Catholic Worker, which is still published today. As you know, the Catholic Worker Movement promoted pacifism that combined direct aid for the poor with nonviolent direct action on their behalf. She promoted an economic theory that's been termed distributism, kind of a third way between capitalism and socialism. That's what she was looking for in this country. She practiced civil disobedience and was arrested on a number of occasions. You may have noticed in a recent America magazine, the title of one of the articles was, Dorothy would have taken a knee. She was that kind of a civil disobedience person. She worked very hard at establishing nonviolence as a Catholic principle. In their 1983 pastoral letter, The Challenge of Peace, the United States Catholic bishops stated, the nonviolent witness of such figures as Dorothy Day and Martin Luther King has had profound impact on the life of the church in the United States. And I think we probably all remember in Pope Francis's recent visit to the United States when he addressed the Congress, he mentioned Dorothy Day in a list of outstanding Americans that included Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., and Thomas Merton. Many consider Dorothy Day to be the most radical in American Catholic Church history. The texts I've selected from Dorothy's vast writings are snippets from her column in The Catholic Worker. This installment is entitled, A Prayer for Peace. In it, Dorothy recounts two trips to Rome during the final days of Vatican II. The bishops were discussing the church's role in the modern world, including such topics as war and peace and the formation of conscience. Dorothy was hoping that the bishops would make a strong statement condemning the means of modern war. That September, she joined a group of 20 women in Rome in order to fast for 10 days and to pray as the council fathers deliberated on these important issues. On another occasion, she joined another group of women who went to express their gratitude to Pope John XXIII for his encyclical, Pacem and Terrace. This ex excerpt is from a column dated December 1965. It says Rome. The fast of the 20 women which I had come to join and which was the primary reason for my visit to Rome during the final session of the council began on October 1st, a Friday. That morning I checked out of my hotel and proceeded to the great square in front of St. Peter's to wait for Barbara Wall and Eileen Egan at the end of the colonnade. We were going to mass together on that first Friday morning. Without tickets, we could, have not, we, we could not have got in, since all the masses which preface the meetings of the council are packed to the doors. The laity received communion, not at the main altar, but at the side altar. All around there were confessionals, frequented, I was edified to see, by bishops and cardinals, their scarlet and purple robes billowing out behind them. They took as long, I noticed, as nuns, who I always thought were scrupulous indeed, judging by the length of their confessions. <laughs> but as I was able to go to confession on that last visit I paid to St. Peter's, and I felt with joy and love that warm sense of community, the family, which is the church how the council has broken down barriers between clergy and laity, and how close the bishops seem to us when they are together from all parts of the world, at home in Rome, and not set apart. On that night in October, 
the fast, those ten days when nothing but water passed our lips, finally ended. Hard though it was, it was but a token fast, considering the problems of the world we live in. It was a small offering of sacrifice, a widow's might, a few loaves and fishes. May we try harder to do more in the future. And she goes on to say, the happy news on the radio this morning is that the Vatican Council has passed with an overwhelming majority the schema on the church in the modern world, included in which is an unequivocal condemnation of nuclear war. It was a statement for which we had been working and praying. That statement is this. Any act of war aimed discriminately, indiscriminately at the destruction of entire cities or of extensive, extensive areas along with their population is a crime against God and man himself. It merits unequivocal and unhesitating condemnation. This is what Dorothy and her friends were waiting for. Then she goes on. As to what change will be brought about by the, the pronouncements of the council? None immediately. But just as there was none when Pope Pius XI spoke out against fascism in Italy, popes speak out as Paul VI did recently at the United Nations. Remember war, never again. But what they say, let's see. But wars go on. There are cheers and rejoicing and seeming assent to what they say, but action does not seem to be influenced. That is, immediately. But in the long run, these words, these pronouncements, after much blood has been shed, influence the course of history, which progresses more and more toward a recognition of man's freedom, his dignity as a child of God, as made in the image and likeness of God. Whether he is communist or imperialist, Russian or American, North or South Vietnamese, all men are brothers. God wills that all men be saved, and we pray daily, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then later, as Pope John told the pilgrimage of women, mothers for peace, the 75 of us who went to Rome to thank him for his encyclical, Pacem and Charis, this was just the month before his death. He said to us, the beginnings of peace are in your own hearts, in your own families, schoolrooms, offices, parishes, and neighborhoods. It is working from the ground up, from the poverty of the stable, in work as at Nazareth, and also in going from town to town, and is in the public life of Jesus, 2,000 years ago. And since a 1,000 years are as one day, and Christianity is but two days old, let us take heart and start now. Now our finer, final preacher here tonight is a man I had never heard of before. I discovered him here in the, through the archives here at Notre Dame, Arthur Tarminiello. He was born in 1906 in Suffolk, Massachusetts. He entered St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, so we started with one, we're ending with one, my alma mater. But unlike Cardinal Gibbons, Cardinal Sheehan, Cardinal Bernadine, and Cardinal Maida, I never heard the Sulpicians brag about Father Tarminiello, and in a few minutes you'll see why. He was ordained from St. Mary's in 1933 for the Diocese of Mobile, Alabama. He had done very impressive, selfless pastoral ministry for many years among the poor tenant farmers of the South. One of his many contributions to their lives was the establishment of what they called St. Teresa's Village as a farming cooperative there in Alabama. In 1939, he published a social activist magazine called Rural Justice which was parallel to one published by Father Coughlin called Social Justice. He established an organization called the Union of Christian Crusaders, which had 40,000 members by 1949. 
He also spoke on radio and television in a show entitled The Pastor's Fireside. Sounds a little like fireside chats maybe, but something was going on there, I think. Somehow, in the midst of all of this, he had obtained a law degree. Finally, after the victory in Japan of World War II, Terminiello filed a petition of 20,000 signatures to urge the Senate to conduct an investigation of the attack on Pearl Harbor and to make the findings public. He suspected, like many other isolationists, that the political establishment in Washington had a hand in the surprise attack. Those who have studied law may be familiar with the United States Supreme Court decision that bears his name, Terminiello versus the city of Chicago, a landmark free speech ruling in 1949. Terminiello had been arrested for giving a speech against Jewish communism, he called it, that incited a small riot in the city. The Supreme Court decision, however, when it finally got to the Supreme Court, was in Terminiello's favor. The court agreed that the city's breach of peace ordinance was unconstitutional. His case is considered one of the more important free speech cases in American legal history. What added notoriety to the case was that Father Terminiello had previously been suspended by the Bishop of Mobile, but he never made that known in Chicago. Well, by 1949, he had stepped back from his anti-Semitic activities, and in May 1949, he was reinstated by the Bishop of Mobile. Despite all of the notoriety attached to his name as an anti-Semite, a social activist, and a strident anti-communist, I suggest that we give him a break here and look for some of the goodness in this man and in this priest. There was more to him than the unfortunate, misguided attitudes that got him into so much trouble. I've chosen a sermon preached by Terminiello at Christmas Midnight Mass in 1945. It was in the Church of the Visitation in Huntsville, Alabama. It was broadcast by the local radio station. Now just keep in mind that World War II is still raging at this time. And this was before the nuclear bombs were dropped, of course. His text is particularly focused on John 1.10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Terminiello begins, reproduced in millions of places throughout the world tonight, is the immortal scene of Bethlehem. Surrounding a makeshift crib in which is a newborn babe are the humble shepherds, the proud but cold virgin mother, and the virtuous foster father of that infant. Overhead, strains of angelic choirs bring news of peace, a strange peace. My friends, Tonight, I could give you an encomium on the beautiful aspects of this feast, on the lights, the handshaking sentimentality. Yes, even on the true love which usually floods human hearts at this season. We could guide our thoughts to the beautiful story of Christmas and the divine infancy. In ordinary times, such a fervorino would be in order. But these are unusual times. Any reference to tonight as a silent night when all is calm would be entirely incongruous. Throughout the whole world, the drum beats of war resound. And men curse and kill one another in a senseless orgy of murder and destruction. No, this is not a silent night when all is calm. The night is not calm for many of you who have loved ones away from home and no amount of decorations, gifts, or patriotic speeches can fill that void in your hearts and homes. 
There is a void too in the hearts of those boys away from your homes as they attend divine worship with the top of a jeep for an altar and with incendiary bombs for the background and light. This day, which was originally a day of worship of the infant king, of gratitude for the mercy of God, of rejoicing because the earth had, in the words of Isaiah, butted forth a savior, this day has become a day of greed for money and power and blood. It has become a day for Santa Claus instead of Christ. No one is willing to kill Santa Claus as they were willing and still are willing to kill Christ. Tonight, as we kneel at the feet of the divine infant Prince of Peace, our prayer should be a prayer for peace. In the midst of war, we can think of and hope for peace. The ambition of individual crusaders should be to take the Christ child out of the manger and put him on a throne. Yes, even on the throne of the United States. For our nation, we shall pray that we may soon discontinue the incongruous attempt to balance the scales of power in Europe by putting our weight on both sides of the scales at the same time. As a nation, we must decide the question suggested by the pagan festivities and the pagan devastation which surround us. Shall it be Santa Claus or Christ? I think most people on Christmas Eve would not be there to hear that, at least today. <laughs> Times were different. So my friends, these are the people I wanted to talk to you about. If you stayed awake, you might have noticed at times that the preaching that we considered tonight had some clear signs of brilliance and effectiveness. But it's not the way we'd preach things today. But as we look back on our history, we can see to a greater or lesser degree how preaching has shaped and articulated our identity as an American Catholic community warts and all. And I guess we who preach today continue to trust, as these, as these preachers did before us, that the Spirit of God will make up for whatever is lacking in our own feeble efforts. Thank you for your, your attention, and I apologize to our preachers for butchering their engaging and significant preaching efforts. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.